Disneyland. animals provides the staple food for carnivores of the crater. Jackal, hyenas, cheetah, and lions. But of all the animals that are found here, it is the lion that dominates. About 80 lions live in family groups or prides of eight or more spread evenly across the crater. From records kept over the past 20 to 30 years, it is known that the number of lions in the crater has remained about the same. The gestation period of the female lion is about 110 days. There is no special birth season and cubs can be born throughout the year. Like most cats, lions usually sleep or rest during the day for up to 21 hours. They will even rest between periods of feasting on a kill. Some will climb into trees to sleep draped over the branches to avoid insects that swarm over them on the ground. Others, gorged with meat from a kill, will roll from side to side, seeking a comfortable position for the large meal bulging in their stomachs. The pride is a complex social structure consisting of from two to 20 or more females and their cubs. The females are related to each other and usually remain together throughout their lives as they do most of the hunting. After a meal, the pride gathers, grooming and touching each other and strengthening their family bonds. During rest periods, the cubs stay close to their mothers or other females. Here in the Ngorongoro crater, water is plentiful most of the year. The lions usually drink once a day, in the early morning or after a kill. Male lions are not permanent members of the pride, which may have from one to four adult males. These may stay in the pride for as long as six years, but more often lead a nomadic life traveling alone or in small groups throughout the crater. When hunting, the pride will either band in small groups or roam alone in search of prey. At times, a female with newborn cubs will seek solitary shelter away from the males. No one is certain if she chooses to leave or is forced away from the close social structure of the pride. Lions have few distinctive markings to assist in recognizing other members of the pride, especially over long distances. Therefore, they must approach another pride member in a direct manner, without hesitation. Should an approaching lion of the pride seem unsure of itself, it may be attacked as if it were a stranger. If a lioness is attacked several times, she may become unsure of herself and eventually leave her pride. In this way, the pride remains relatively stable in size. Like most young cats, lion cubs spend a great deal of time playing. 
Their games of attack prepare them for the lifelong search for food. These two, a male and a female, are about a year old. The females are less temperamental than the males and show little reaction to mistaken identity. So most females remain with the pride, while the young males are eventually forced to leave. By the time they are two and a half to three and a half years old, young males are forced out by the mature males who take over the pride for mating. And so the pride receives an infusion of new blood from the mature males who fight for mating privileges. But in time, these males will be driven off by the younger breeding lions. Due to increased tourism, the lions have become accustomed to vehicles and to humans filming and observing their behavior. The camera crew has left the camera running while the young lions inspect the tires. They are distracted by a shout from the cameraman who is more in fear for the safety of the tires than for his companions. Quiet. Don't. Don't. into the taller grass, they are now at risk by the stalking female lions. The mottled brown coat of the lioness blends perfectly with the tall grass, now parched and brown in the summer sun. Hardly moving, the great cat waits for the unwary zebra to move closer to its place of concealment. It is not unusual for only one lion to hunt a zebra. Even though she may have greater success in numbers, once the lioness reaches her prey, the zebra will have little chance of survival. She stalks downwind of the zebra, slowly working her way closer and closer. Now joined by another lioness, she continues to wait for the zebras to move closer. Lions do not have the speed or stamina of other great cats, like the cheetah, and must wait patiently while their prey moves closer, and then, with a short sprint, attempt a quick kill. Now less than 50 feet from the zebra, the lioness waits. She is barely visible to the unsuspecting herd. She begins to close in, hunched low in the tall grass. the zebra to the ground. The rest of the pride begins to devour the still living zebra. Still breathing, the zebra dies in what must be terrible agony as the great beasts gorge. Their stomachs filled clean each other by licking the still fresh blood from each other's muzzles and coats. After the kill, the lioness joins her cubs and begins a long rest period to digest her meal. Some miles away, a second pride is preparing to hunt. Lions, like most carnivorous animals, live within a well-defended territory. This territory must contain a source of water and plentiful food and can encompass from 10 to 100 square miles. In the heart of the territory, the lioness is able to bear her cubs, protected by the other members of the pride. On this day, a water buffalo has been killed near an access road in the crater. Unconcerned by passing tourists' vehicles, the pride runs to the fresh kill.
The pride's territory is carefully guarded by the dominant males. Roaring to alert trespassers, the male rushes forward, bellowing his rage to deter nomadic lions from entering his territory. Now safe from outsiders, the pride is on the move, possibly searching for more game or a protected water source. This pride has a large concentration of cubs and yearlings. Stretched out along the access road, they seem indifferent to time or distance as they slowly make their way following the others. stretches out in the high grass and rests throughout most of the day. It is difficult to determine why they have decided to move from one part of their territory to another. Even at rest, the females keep close watch over the young cubs. Lions have a well-defined system of communication. Using body contact, facial movement, and sounds, a lion expresses itself clearly to other members of the pride and to strangers who may try to enter its territory. As spring turns to summer, a flock of crowned cranes flies over a herd of zebra feeding on the open savanna. In the marsh, chicks of the blacksmith plover search for small bugs and then seek shelter in the feathers of their parent. Emerging from her hiding place, a female and three very small cubs set out to join the pride. For the young cubs, it is a long trip across the open plain. Camouflaged by the long grass, the female usually remains in hiding until her cubs are old enough to walk. Lion cubs are almost helpless when born. Weighing from two to five pounds at birth, they can barely crawl and do not open their eyes before one or two weeks. Newborn cubs have a slightly spotted coat, which helps to hide them in the thick grass. This color changes after three to five months. Sensing that the smallest and weakest cub is falling behind, the lioness gently carries it by the neck across a dry mud bank, while the other two cubs scurry to keep up. Slowly making her way past the others, she selects her spot. Oh. 
Here she rests while the cubs nurse. When several lionesses give birth at the same time, they frequently share the duties of raising all the cubs. This communal area then becomes the general meeting place for the entire pride. Communal gatherings allow all members of the pride to become acquainted with the cubs. of Lake Makat, a flock of migrating birds pause to feed. Among the trees, a small herd of zebra and an old elephant with only one tusk feed peacefully in the clear morning air. Near the lake shore, gazelles graze contentedly as they share their pasture with a flock of ducks. Knee deep in the mud of the swamp, a huge water buffalo wallows contentedly. The buffalo is the lion's largest and most formidable prey and is capable of putting a marauding lion to flight. Lions are usually wary of an adult buffalo, which can severely injure or kill an adult lion with its sharp horns. During the heat of the day, the pride rests in the soft, high grass. The lion leads a life without threat, for their only real enemy, the hyena, will not attack the entire pride. If caught alone on the plain, an adult lion and cubs, or even young adults, can be at great risk from a pack of hyena. In the afternoon, the yearlings spar with one another, or their mother, who usually gives them a quick swat for their trouble. Then, relaxed and seemingly full of affection for the cubs, the female joins in the afternoon play. A young male and female of the pride also share in mock combat, which helps them sharpen their skills for real attacks as hunting adults. Late in the afternoon, the pride begins its quest for prey. Separated from a small herd of zebra by the mud flats of a slowly drying lake, two females are forced to leap a small stream. Now the yearling male must also cross. He seems in a quandary whether he should jump as the adult females have done or swim. Most cats are excellent swimmers, but they will avoid the water unless it is absolutely necessary. spreads out across the plain, making its way to a herd of zebra over a mile away. Screened by the high grass, the lions stealthily approach the zebra. With the wind blowing from the zebra toward the lions, the zebra are unaware of the approaching danger. Lions are known to approach their prey from either upwind or downwind. Time seems to stand still as the zebra slowly pass before one and then another of the crouching hunters. The 
zebra are crossing this area to graze near a large herd of wildebeest. Now, one lioness begins to move toward the zebra. Nearby, the entire pride is waiting for the moment to charge. Both wildebeest and zebra now seem to sense the presence of danger and barely move, uncertain from which direction an attack may come. Then, as if spectators at a sporting match, the herd watches as the lion attacks. slower than zebra and wildebeest and are only about 30% successful even when hunting in a group. After resting, the pride prepares for another attempt. The dominant female heads off in the direction of a large herd of buffalo. Extremely dangerous, the African water buffalo can weigh as much as a ton. The males gather around the periphery of the herd and the females and calves stay closer to the center. Seldom do one or two lions attempt an attack on a small herd of buffalo, or even on a single member that is feeding alone. But on occasion, whether they are truly hungry or just young lions practicing their hunting skills, such an encounter happens. It is seldom rewarding for the lions. Suspicious, short-tempered, and cunning, the buffalo is a formidable adversary and are extremely aggressive when confronted by a lion. In such short grass, the lions come as close as they can. Then they attack. Buffalo are quickly outrun by the lions. It's not a fair match. Two lions and three buffalo. The lions quickly break off when the buffalo turn to confront them. Closer to the lake, a larger herd is peacefully grazing. Here the grass is higher, which affords the lion better protection from being seen. Working as a team, the pride takes up position along the edge of the buffalo herd and move in. Surprised, the herd bolts, then just as quickly, whirl around to face their attackers and counterattack. The buffalo chase after the lions, who are now fleeing for their lives.
On the prowl again, the pride spots a lone buffalo feeding in the high grass along the edge of a swamp. Separated from its herd, a single buffalo is still extremely dangerous and must be approached with caution. This large male, with its ear torn from either previous attacks or thorn bushes, is joined by a wattled starling who makes a meal from the ticks that infests the hide of the bull. Deciding to attack, the pride begins to stalk the bull. from the combined weight of the two lions, the bull stumbles. The other lions leap on him, robbing the bull of its strength. A yearling bravely joins the fight and attacks the bull's head. approach to drive the lions away, but the lions are not easily dissuaded. them a chance of making a kill. The injured bull seeks refuge in the swamp, but the lions hold their position at the edge of the herd.
buffalo and head toward shore for a long rest. Great clouds begin to build over the crater as the dry season gives way to the wet. Lying at three degrees south, just below the equator, the Ngorongoro has only two seasons, wet and dry. November is the beginning of the wet, and as the rains fall, the season of renewal begins. Now the entire crater ecosystem absorbs the life-giving moisture and the parched ground bursts into life. For all of the animals of the crater, it is a time of patient waiting until the rains stop. Wildebeest, Grant's gazelle, lion, all soak in the cool rain. Within a week, the crater will turn green and a carpet of yellow flowers will cover the savanna. With the gray dust of the dry season finally settled by the rain, the crater puts forth the sweet, earthy smell of a new spring. The sun bursts forth to disclose the broad green carpet of the crater floor. Now the lake will fill, frogs emerge from the mud, and millions of insects issue forth as a banquet for the thousands of birds that quickly return to this extraordinary valley. African spoonbill preen each other's feathers as a black-winged stilt probes the shallows for tiny aquatic organisms. Each day, rain falls on the crater and the grass. The primary energy source for agility is the only defense against the lion, hyena, and cheetah. With their umbilical cords still hanging from their stomachs, the young wildebeest cavort, while another newborn, less than an hour old, stays close to its mother's side. Close by, a female and calf share a small stream with a flock of sacred ibis. The female is ever cautious of marauding carnivores. Near the service road that crosses the crater, a female lion with three cubs has emerged from hiding and is slowly moving to rejoin the pride. Young cubs like these have bluish-gray eyes for the first few weeks after birth. Then their eyes turn an amber color. Between the periods of rain, the pride sleeps in the midday sun. Although cooler than the dry season, here at the equator, the days are warm and pleasant. With plentiful game, the lions are well fed and peaceful. Hidden from view of the pride, a young male has been in hiding for over a week, nursing injuries received during a hunt. Now it emerges, its hind leg obviously swollen with a festering wound. Slowly, it approaches its mother, the lion which has just had the three cubs. Although she recognizes him, she is fearful and backs away, not quite sure what is wrong. Lions are very cautious of unusual behavior among the members of the pride, and usually will drive a sick or wounded member away. Another lioness rebuffs the injured male with a cuff of its paw, and then snaps with bared fangs. Then the entire pride moves its location, leaving the young male to fend for itself. So weak it can hardly care for its wound, the male is no longer able to live with the pride. With no support from a mature male, 10 juveniles are running riot. On a hunt, their inexperience spells disaster. For balance to be restored, lessons must be learned. It's always a noisy affair. 26 heads don't fit comfortably around the carcass so it's a struggle for space. 
This is Whitehead. It's her kill. She's the oldest female in the pride and takes the lead on most hunts. Her lighter coloring distinguishes her from the rest of the females. Whitehead is one of 16 lionesses, all related sisters, mothers, and daughters. Their pride contains more than three times the average number of pride lionesses, making it a mega pride. Despite the female's hunting prowess, nine teenage males dominate the kill. All between two and three years old, these adolescents display the scruffy beginnings of a mane. They're bigger and stronger than the females and easily push their mothers and aunts out of the way. But the nine males have a younger sister, Pemba, the juvenile female. With nine unruly bullies for brothers, she has a tough time getting enough to eat. Nearby stalks TB Lioness, Pemba's aunt. Her patchy fur and emaciated frame indicate she's infected with tuberculosis and only has a few months to live. Even though TB is contagious, she still feeds among the group, putting the whole family at risk. Five kilometers away, the two pride males patrol. They are the fathers of all ten adolescents, but haven't visited the pride for over six months. Once cubs are 18 months old, they no longer require direct protection from their fathers. Pride males then move away from the family and focus on defending the territory's borders. On the perimeter, they advertise their claim to the Mega Pride with roaring and scent marking. Every 150 meters, they spray a pungent hormone, which warns rival males to stay away. This scent barrier must be continually reinforced, and a round trip can take the brothers over two weeks. It's hard work to patrol and mark, but it's preferable to an all-out fight. Tonight, the fighting comes from within. A clash over food ends in a pride split-off. The adolescent male's aggression is too much. Two mothers and their adult daughters can do better alone. The pride shrinks to 18. Lion prides of 30 or even 40 members aren't freak occurrences of nature. But they do require a unique set of circumstances. A core group of breeding females and continuous access to food and water. In the Kruger National Park, the 15,000 hectare Singita Concession is the perfect home for the Mega Pride. Here, they control a diverse area of prime real estate. Scrub, grassland, and rocky outcrops right next to the Wenetsi River. Resident herds of impala and buffalo provide sufficient food through the winter and summer months. Today, the pride must get used to fewer members. The burden to provide enough food and water falls to the remaining adult females. Providing water for their sons is easy, just a daily trip to the river with the family. But dusk means it's time for dinner, and with their numbers reduced, that might prove difficult.
Lions are active after dark. Exceptional night vision gives them an advantage over their prey. Whitehead spots an opportunity. Impala. She's joined by her sisters, Duclaw and Tawny. Usually, the three sisters work together as chasers and drive prey toward a second group of lionesses who act as catchers. But tonight, it's a depleted team. No pride mates wait in ambush. They will have to chase and catch their own prey. Over long distances, impalas run faster than lions. So the sisters must get as close as possible before they charge. Duclaw waits for her chance. But she's spotted. Tawny does even better. But again, the Impala's warning call gives away her position. With the Impala herd spooked, Whitehead and her sisters abandon the hunt. Morning offers a new chance to look for prey. This rocky outcrop provides the females with a panoramic view of the grasslands below. Whitehead knows they can't wait for the cover of darkness to hunt again and sets off. Dewclaw heads out with her. And today, TB Lioness completes the hunting trio. As usual, the juveniles aren't tempted to join. Whitehead runs ahead of her sisters. She wants to get in front of the zebra and position herself as the catcher. Duclaw will be the chaser. Tired after the long walk, sickly TB switches to a spectator. Whitehead gets in position. Lions aren't able to chase prey very long. Their stocky bodies are designed for the sprint and pounce of the ambush attack. Duclaw must make sure the zebra doesn't detect her. Long grass offers perfect cover. The trap is set. The ambush works. The zebra's death cries alert the rest of the family. They eat the zebra alive. With 18 lions pinning down their quarry, the pride is in no danger of being kicked. 
Pemba manages to squeeze in in front. But there isn't space for them all. The only option is double-decker feeding. TB lioness loses her place. The teenage males just bully their way in. Jostling for position, many faces are slashed. Even Whitehead, the Mega Pride's eldest female, has a tough time negotiating space. When they split the carcass open, the adolescents fight for the softer internal organs. With the rib cage exposed, the zebra is easy to tear apart, so each lion fights for a good ripping position. Enjoying a joint alone is the ultimate prize. They won't all be successful. But nothing goes to waste. They consume muscle, bone, and skin. While some Pride members are sated, others wait for the last scraps. This 250 kilogram zebra won't fill them all. On an empty stomach, the lionesses and juveniles can each gorge 25 kilograms of meat. So for a feast, 25 kilograms times 18 lions means they're one zebra short. Whitehead and the rest of the females must work harder to feed their family. In April, the dry season arrives and slowly transforms Singida. the grazing herds struggle to find any succulent green grass. A change has also taken place in the Megapride. The adult females need support to catch enough food, and the adolescents are now old enough to learn effective hunting techniques. Tawny, Duclaw, and Whitehead take the juveniles for a lesson. The novices take their cue from Whitehead. Some animals are better left alone. Impala would offer perfect practice. But this herd's seen the youngsters, robbing the lions of the element of surprise. Tawny has her sights set on something larger. A giraffe would make a fine meal. The teenagers position themselves to cut off the giraffe when it bolts. Tawny begins to stalk. Whitehead and Duclaw stay behind her and reinforce the catchers.
Tawny must get the giraffe to change direction for the ambush to work. Wary of the lioness, the giraffe obliges. But the inexperienced catchers aren't in position. They didn't anticipate the giraffe's path. The hunt fails. The pride is not working as a cohesive unit. The youngsters need more training. That night, the Mega Pride returns unsuccessful and hungry. A lion can go a week without food, but this is day five, and Whitehead knows they're getting desperate. The Pride doesn't rest. Every lion is alert for prey. Even TB searches tonight. Suddenly, an opportunity. This three tons of meat would leave no one hungry. Whitehead investigates the potential meal with one of the young males. If they're to bring down a hippo, they'll need the entire Mega Pride. It's a dangerous undertaking. A hippopotamus can pierce straight through a lion. In a clash between size and numbers, both predator and prey consider their options. Whitehead makes her decision. The hippo tries to flee, but Whitehead has the support of the pride. Feed, the lions must knock the hippo off balance and pull it sideways. But the young male doesn't have the strength. Whitehead tries, but the rest of the family hangs back. Desperate, they tear at the hippo's spine and rear. This time, it's a warning. It's safer behind their quarry. Whitehead easily pierces the hippo's six centimeter hide for a quick drink. Without help from a mature male, a bloodletting may be all they'll get. In some areas, lions obtain all their moisture from the blood and body fluids of their prey. But the hippo's not staying around for that. DB grabs her turn, but the rest of the pride is unwilling to keep up the attack. The females press forward, but the adolescents are listless and uncoordinated, unsure what to do next. Hippo takes advantage of the standoff. Duclaw didn't see it coming. 900 kilograms of pressure clamped down on her skull. Pride still distracted from the vicious attack, the hippo flees.
This time, it heads straight for the water. It's a disaster. The pride will go hungry again. They haven't learned to work together as a single unit. And now Whitehead's lost a valuable hunter. Duclaw is badly injured. It's doubtful she'll make it through the night. Today, the lions are awake at first light. A young male tries to offer Duclaw support, but even a lick is too painful. Duclaw suffers from a brain hemorrhage and a damaged right eye. But she also has a puncture wound under her neck where the hippo's incisor pierced straight through into her mouth. Only rest will bring some relief. That evening, the pride continues to hold vigil. There was no hunt today. Duclaw has recovered, but she's not well enough to join her sisters. The graveness of the pride situation is not felt by all. The teenagers are always ready for a game. Though Pemba, the young female, would probably choose a different one. They seem unaffected by the failed hunts. When one brother pulls a mature female into their fun, it awakens a new interest. Flooded with testosterone, it's natural for the young males to notice the opposite sex. To read the female scent, the young male curls his lips back into what's known as the flamen grimace. This draws the smell over a specialized organ in the roof of his mouth, or he's able to detect her receptiveness. Instinct takes over. There's no penetration, but it is an indication of the male's sexual maturity and a sign that they should leave the pride. Nearby, Pemba tries to play with Dewclaw. But the injured lioness is too badly hurt for games. She distances herself from the pride. Her frustration is clear. But 
she isn't alone. This is a united protest, a cry for help. In Africa's Kruger National Park, a mega pride of lions is at breaking point. The lionesses can't provide enough food, so every meal is a battleground. With no support from a mature male, ten juveniles are running riot. On a hunt, their inexperience spells disaster. For balance to be restored, lessons must be learned in the Lion Army. Dinner time, and for this family, it's always a noisy affair. Twenty-six heads don't fit comfortably around the carcass, so it's a struggle for space. This is Whitehead. It's her kill. She's the oldest female in the pride and takes the lead on most hunts. Her lighter coloring distinguishes her from the rest of the females. Whitehead is one of sixteen lionesses all related sisters, mothers, and daughters. Their pride contains more than three times the average number of pride lionesses, making it a mega pride. Despite the female's hunting prowess, nine teenage males dominate the kill. All between two and three years old, these adolescents display the scruffy beginnings of a mane. They're bigger and stronger than the females, and easily push their mothers and aunts out of the way. But the nine males have a younger sister, Pemba, the juvenile female. With nine unruly bullies for brothers, she has a tough time getting enough to eat. Nearby stalks TB Lioness, Pemba's aunt. Her patchy fur and emaciated frame indicate she's infected with tuberculosis and only has a few months to live. Even though TB is contagious, she still feeds among the group, putting the whole family at risk. Five kilometers away, the two pride males patrol. They are the fathers of all ten adolescents, but haven't visited the pride for over six months. Once cubs are 18 months old, they no longer require direct protection from their fathers. Pride males then move away from the family and focus on defending the territory's borders. On the perimeter, they advertise their claim to the mega pride with roaring and scent marking. Every 150 meters, they spray a pungent hormone, which warns rival males to stay away. This scent barrier must be continually reinforced, and a round trip can take the brothers over two weeks. It's hard work to patrol and mark, but it's preferable to an all-out fight. Tonight, the fighting comes from within. A clash over food ends in a pride split-off. The adolescent male's aggression is too much. Two mothers and their adult daughters can do better alone. The pride shrinks to 18.
lion prides of 30 or even 40 members aren't freak occurrences of nature. But they do require a unique set of circumstances. A core group of breeding females and continuous access to food and water. In the Kruger National Park, the 15,000 hectare Singita concession is the perfect home for the megapide. Here, they control a diverse area of prime real estate. Scrub, grassland, and rocky outcrops right next to the Wenetsi River. Resident herds of impala and buffalo provide sufficient food through the winter and summer months. Today, the pride must get used to fewer members. The burden to provide enough food and water falls to the remaining adult females. Providing water for their sons is easy, just a daily trip to the river with the family. But dusk means it's time for dinner, and with their numbers reduced, that might prove difficult. Lions are active after dark. Exceptional night vision gives them an advantage over their prey. Whitehead spots an opportunity. Impala. She's joined by her sisters, Duclaw and Tawny. Usually, the three sisters work together as chasers and drive prey toward a second group of lionesses who act as catchers. But tonight, it's a depleted team. No pride mates wait in ambush. They will have to chase and catch their own prey. Over long distances, impalas run faster than lions so the sisters must get as close as possible before they charge. Duclaw waits for her chance. But she's spotted. Tawny does even better. But again, the Impala's warning call gives away her position. With the Impala herd spooked, Whitehead and her sisters abandon the hunt. Morning offers a new chance to look for prey. This rocky outcrop provides the females with a panoramic view of the grasslands below. Whitehead knows they can't wait for the cover of darkness to hunt again and sets off. Duclaw heads out with her. And today, TB Lioness completes the hunting trio. As usual, the juveniles aren't tempted to join. Whitehead runs ahead of her sisters. She wants to get in front of the zebra and position herself as the catcher.
Dewclaw will be the chaser. Tired after the long walk, sickly TB switches to a spectator. Whitehead gets in position. Lions aren't able to chase prey very long. Their stocky bodies are designed for the sprint and pounce of the ambush attack. Duclaw must make sure the zebra doesn't detect her. The long grass offers perfect cover. works. The zebra's death cries alert the rest of the family. They eat the zebra alive. With 18 lions pinning down their quarry, the pride is in no danger of being kicked. Pemba manages to squeeze in in front. there isn't space for them all. The only option is double-decker feeding. TB Lioness loses her place. The teenage males just bully their way in. Jostling for position, many faces are slashed. Even Whitehead, the Mega Pride's eldest female, has a tough time negotiating space. When they split the carcass open, the adolescents fight for the softer internal organs. With the rib cage exposed, the zebra is easy to tear apart, so each lion fights for a good ripping position. Enjoying a joint alone is the ultimate prize. They won't all be successful, but nothing goes to waste. They consume muscle, bone, and skin. While some Pride members are sated, others wait for the last grabs. This 250 kilogram zebra won't fill them all. On an empty stomach, the lionesses and juveniles can each gorge 25 kilograms of meat. So for a feast, 25 kilograms times 18 lions means they're one zebra short. Whitehead and the rest of the females must work harder to feed their family. In April, the dry season arrives and slowly transforms Singida. The grazing herds struggle to find any succulent green grass. 
a change has also taken place in the megapride. The adult females need support to catch enough food, and the adolescents are now old enough to learn effective hunting techniques. Tawny, Dewclaw, and Whitehead take the juveniles for a lesson. The novices take their cue from Whitehead. Some animals are better left alone. Impala would offer perfect practice. But this herd's seen the youngsters, robbing the lions of the element of surprise. Tawny has her sights set on something larger. A giraffe would make a fine meal. The teenagers position themselves to cut off the giraffe when it bolts. Tawny begins to stalk. Whitehead and Dewclaw stay behind her and reinforce the catchers. Tawny must get the giraffe to change direction for the ambush to work. Wary of the lioness, the giraffe obliges. But the inexperienced catchers aren't in position. They didn't anticipate the giraffe's path. The hunt fails. The pride is not working as a cohesive unit. The youngsters need more training. night, the Mega Pride returns unsuccessful and hungry. A lion can go a week without food, but this is day five, and Whitehead knows they're getting desperate. The Pride doesn't rest. Every lion is alert for prey. Even TB searches tonight. Suddenly, an opportunity. This three tons of meat would leave no one hungry. Whitehead investigates the potential meal with one of the young males. If they're to bring down a hippo, they'll need the entire Megapride. It's a dangerous undertaking. A hippopotamus can pierce straight through a lion. In a clash between size and numbers, both predator and prey consider their options. Whitehead makes her decision. The hippo tries to flee, but Whitehead has the support of the pride. The lions must knock the hippo off balance and pull it sideways. But the young male doesn't have the strength. Whitehead tries, but the rest of the family hangs back. Desperate, they tear at the hippo's spine and rear. This time, it's a warning. It's safer behind their quarry. Whitehead easily pierces the hippo's six-centimeter hide for a quick drink. 
without help from a mature male, a bloodletting may be all they'll get. In some areas, lions obtain all their moisture from the blood and body fluids of their prey. But the hippo's not staying around for that. TB grabs her turn, but the rest of the pride is unwilling to keep up the attack. The females press forward, but the adolescents are listless and uncoordinated, unsure what to do next. The hippo takes advantage of the standoff. Duclaw didn't see it coming. 900 kilograms of pressure clamped down on her skull. Pride still distracted from the vicious attack, the hippo flees. This time, it heads straight for the water. It's a disaster. The pride will go hungry again. They haven't learned to work together as a single unit. And now Whitehead's lost a valuable hunter. Duclaw is badly injured. It's doubtful she'll make it through the night. Today, the lions are awake at first light. A young male tries to offer Duclaw support, but even a lick is too painful. Duclaw suffers from a brain hemorrhage and a damaged right eye. But she also has a puncture wound under her neck with the hippo's incisor pierced straight through into her mouth. Only rest will bring some relief. That evening, the pride continues to hold vigil. There was no hunt today. Duclaw has recovered, but she's not well enough to join her sisters. The graveness of the pride situation is not felt by all. The teenagers are always ready for a game. Though Pemba, the young female, would probably choose a different one. They seem unaffected by the failed hunts.
when one brother pulls a mature female into their fun, it awakens a new interest. Flooded with testosterone, it's natural for the young males to notice the opposite sex. To read the female scent, the young male curls his lips back into what's known as the flamen grimace. This draws the smell over a specialized organ in the roof of his mouth, where he's able to detect her receptiveness. Instinct takes over. There's no penetration, but it is an indication of the male's sexual maturity and a sign that they should leave the pride. Nearby, Pemba tries to play with Dewclaw. But the injured lioness is too badly hurt for games. She distances herself from the pride. Her frustration is clear. But she isn't alone. This is a united protest, a cry for help. The seasons turn once again and herald a change for the Mega Pride. After four months, the young lions are now proficient catchers and chasers, and most evenings end in a meal. Tonight, there's a fresh challenge for these adolescents. Baby brothers and sisters. Three new members of the family are introduced. The pride males have fulfilled a further duty and produced another generation of cubs that carry their genes. The first cub is drawn to the carcass, but the second cub remembers his manners. It's instinctive for the weaker animal to initiate the greeting in lion society. As dutiful youngsters, they acknowledge their big brothers. The cubs will now be welcomed on the carcass as full members of the pride. The little female is thirsty. But her siblings tuck in like pros. This set of youngsters won't have to fight for their meals. The crisis is over. With the adolescents pulling their weight, there's enough food for them all. The loner has picked up some flack. 
Pemba is curious about this younger sister. Just like Pemba, the little female will have to get used to the rough attention of her older siblings. At seven weeks old, a cub is ready to eat meat, though they will continue to suckle till eight months. It's a tight squeeze for the last cub home. But she'll persevere. After all, the blood of the Mega Pride runs in her veins. In a lion pride, group dynamics are constantly changing. Pemba, no longer the littlest, is ready to take her place alongside her mothers and aunts. Whitehead, Duclaw, and Tawny continue to lead the hunts, but now enjoy the support of their young sons. The two brothers at the head of the family have a renewed sense of purpose. A new generation to lead and protect. In time, the six adolescent males will leave the pride and make a life of their own. But for now, 